So, Father, thank you. Uh, thank you that we can be together. Thank you that we can have these relationships. But thank you that we can have a relationship with you that's real and personal. Thank you that you speak to us. Uh, and your God is present with us. So, work among us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, I'm going to start a series in the book of Galatians. I'm going to take over the next while, and I'm not going to make promises how long, because I'm not that good. You know, some guys go into a, a sermon series, and they go, okay, we're going to get cover Galatians in six weeks. I don't know how you do that, but they do it. Um, we'll, we'll take it as it comes, but I, I'm hoping it's going to be really meaningful and helpful for us. But if we... I guess to sort of get to just give an overview kind of sort of idea of what it, what it is. It's all about the gospel. And, and it's really emphasizing again and again and again that the gospel is good news. Don't we? I think we need good news in these days. Like you, you read the papers, you read, watch news or <coughs> nobody reads papers anymore, of course. Uh, that's... I'm speaking to my era of people. Um, we used to read newspapers. If you've never seen one, it's a, a whole lot of paper. Um, but we, uh, w the news just seems to be bad news all the time. It's like that person criticizing that one. You don't know whether it's true. You don't know whether it's biased. You, you, you just don't know anything about the news. But I want to tell you something. What Paul does in this letter is he just unpacks the gospel again and again. And he just shows, like brings us reality to us. The gospel is good news for us. Now, maybe you're wondering about why we would even go through a book of the Bible. Um, I guess I kind of start every time we do a book of the Bible, we start with something like this. Um, but I think it's a good question for me to just go back and remind you. All of these books that we read, like the New Testament, these are letters. They would have probably been read in one go to a church. You know, we, we take our verses um, and we go, oh, there's an isolated verse there and there's an isolated verse there. But all these verses that we, we use uh, have context for it. And it's good to put the, that into context and understand. Another thing is, um, when you go through, work through a Bible book, you don't choose the topic for the week. The scriptures choose that for you. So I don't get the, the, the right to go, I'm, I don't, I'm not comfortable with that. I don't want to talk about that subject. I'm going to talk about that subject, and I've got to see the heart of God in that subject for us for that day. So it's actually really important. Um, otherwise, I think there's enough, uh, enough preachers around who are just, you know, preaching what's, th what's they comfortable with. Um, I'm not going to be preaching what I'm comfortable with all the time. The other thing is, this is a 2,000-year-old document. It's a letter written 2,000 years ago. And here's the thing, it has relevance for us today. Do you, it, this is the incredible thing. Something written 2,000 years ago has relevance for us today. And we need to explore that. What is it saying to us today? Why is this so important? But it deals with the gospel as well. That's why I've chosen Galatians. Because, you know, we're, we're talking about, and it's even come out of your language today. We've talked about being a people on mission, right? The heart of the mission is the gospel. So it's living the gospel, finding, how, understanding it and living that out, having it, the application in, of the gospel in our lives every day. And that's what we have to wrestle with. How does the, what, how does the gospel speak into my situation, whatever it is, whether I'm having conflict with my wife, whether I'm having conflict with my neighbor, whether I'm in the workspace and it's like really difficult or it's a joy or, you know, I don't want to talk to anybody. Maybe it's a hostile place to you being a Christian. Maybe it's not. But how do you live out the gospel as a, in that place? How do you live as a missionary in that place? And I think this is what Galatians begins to help us with and, and as we understand the gospel. So let's start off. I want to read just for today because not everybody's in here. There's 
you know, a few people out. Um, but I want to just read the first five verses of Galatians, and I'm just going to look at that today. Is that good? Great stuff. So in your Bible, if you've got one, there's some at the back. You, why don't you turn to Galatians chapter uh, 1, and I'm going to read the first five verses. It's on the screen as well. And it says this, Paul, an apostle, not from men or by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. I don't know what it's like for you, but, you know, when I go see a doctor or, I, you know, get an electrician or somebody like that, you kind of want to know what their credentials are. You want to know that they are, they are the right people for what you need to be doing at that point. Um, when we look at this, you know, this is a, it's one of those places where Paul s starts off by stating his authority. And Paul, the apostle, He's the guy who's writing this, but he starts off by stating his authority. He comes into this and he goes, I want you to know that who I am, I want to know why I am who I am. This isn't um, just made up stuff. I don't know if you've seen The King's Speech. Anybody seen the movie The King's Speech? So you might remember in the, 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 the movie, um, which is, I'm told, based on reality, King George VI has seen a speech therapist so he can learn to speak well because he's now going to speak to a nation, a kingdom. And when he discovers that the therapist has no qualifications but has learned his trade through experience and nothing else, his world is shattered. See, like, it's amazing how often we, like, wait, you, you, need quali you need to be able to tell me how, how I do this? We, well, I want you to know. Uh, I want you to have something that's going to uh, give you a qualification or something. And uh, sometimes experience is the thing that qualifies us. In actual fact, uh, it's, it's an interesting world we live in today because very few people. I don't know what your lives are like. Maybe you're, you're the exception. But in the world, as in general, few people they finish where they started. They very few. You know, most people have a few different career changes along the way. But how do you build up that authority? Well, Paul comes out and he, he points out this. He says, I'm an apostle. He, he identifies himself as a, an apostle. As if that's not good enough, he articulates this further. He wants, gives understanding to us. And it says, the, the authority has not come from man. But the authority is from God. He says, I'm appointed by God for this. You know what? Just think about that. When he says, Paul, an apostle, not from men or by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Uh, I wonder what you, you feel at that point. You know, as I read that, I just feel there's a weightiness in the office. He's... He's just so conscious that I, I never chose this thing. This has been chosen for me. He's been given this as a trust by God. He's put himself, he hasn't put himself here. Nobody has put him there. This is from God. And he knew that he would need to give account to God at the end of the day. You know, when God entrusts you with something, He's going to hold you to account for what he's put into your care. So, so ultimately, this is, this is exalting God. This, him embracing this role as an apostle. Now, it's interesting, though. I, 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 just so you know, I, I still believe that uh, there are apostles today. Right now, he's not one. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I do believe that there, there's potentially apostles today. I, I think that's a, another thing we can talk about. But 
I get scared when I watch television or I see self-made apostles who love authority and power with it. You know, guys going, hey, I'm going to become the bishop. I'm going to just appoint myself to the bishop or I'll just call myself apostle. Uh, can you imagine that? Me walking around, guys, from now on, you can call me Apostle Bruce. AB. <laughs> you, you had uh, PB. Uh, pin, uh, it's peanut butter. And, and J. <laughs> Jam. But, but yeah, uh, we will. Uh, but here's the thing it's, it's crazy because. Paul was very concerned that people realize that this is not something he's, of his own making. He, he never chose this. Like, he really never wanted, he never went out and gone, I, I, I want to be one of the apostles. <laughs> Let me be one of the apostles. No, he was, I'm going to, this is from God. And when he felt that, the weightiness of the, the office, and then he feels the weight of the task. You know, you can pick this up in the tone of this whole letter. This is not... A light letter. This isn't one that you're going to walk away going, man, he's so funny there. No, there's, there's a weightiness through this thing. Because he's speaking to a situation that is serious for the church. He's, this isn't light. And the work of an apostle was to be a master builder and foundation layer. And he was about proclaiming and protecting the unfathomable, unfathomable riches of Christ. And he, he knew what he would preach. He was out to preach the gospel. I want to preach Christ and him crucified. He wanted to see people set free, not under condemnation. This is big stuff. He, he wanted to see something happening. In the gospel, the kingdom's advance in people's lives. But it was also, he was humbled by this call. And this left Paul, amazed by grace. And I think as we go through this, you're going to pick this up. We've already picked it up ourselves today. It's like as we look back, look back, remember what God has done. Don't forget what he has done in your life. There's something that humbles us. You know, when we, if we get to the place where we begin to get a little bit arrogant in our walk with God, we need to go back to the beginning and just remind, be reminded it's all of grace. Now, I think the one other thing here is he still stays confident because he knows who has called him. But I think that this is speaking to us today because something that each of ourselves has to, we all have to ask a question. We have to ask this question, what has God entrusted to me? He had to come to the place where he knew that God had called him to be an apostle. And he needed to perform the duties in the office of an apostle faithfully to God. So here's the question for you. What has God entrusted to you? I don't know whether the, any, the office of an apostle has been given to anybody here. God has called me to be a pastor. And I have to stand before him one day and give an account for that. But what has God called you to be? You're not called to be Paul. See, I want to say to you today, some of you, God has called you to be what you are and what you're doing in the workplace. But he's called you to embrace the gospel and an eternal perspective within that. God has put you there. God has called you into that place. God has called you into the marketplace to be missionaries. It's, it's so crazy how we feel this, this dichotomy in our day, like, okay, the man of God thing, and we often put, and I think there's, honestly, there's something we've got to honor and we've got to respect, but I think at the, at the same time we go, everything else is lesser. No, God has you put you in places that I can't go to. He's equipped you with skills that I don't have, and he's given you the personality and the abilities that you have to serve his purposes in the workplace, in the marketplace. Are you being faithful to that? Because I think the same thing, you know, you, you could be going, I, like I could be saying, I'm Bruce, the pastor, called by God. 
appointed by God, not by man. And honestly, I think I would have given up if it was my choice. Um, but I'd, I keep going because God is going, no, Bruce, you've got to do it again. You've got to do it again. What is God calling you into? Sometimes we, we interpret life events as if that's an, oh, no, God's obviously showing me that my life, work situation is tough, so I need to leave. No, maybe God is calling you to endure in that toughness. And some of you have had to do that because he wants you to be a testimony of his grace. I want you to see another thing here, though. He doesn't do this, his ministry alone. He says, and the brothers. He, he goes, Paul, an apostle, and not, not for, uh, from men or by man, but by Jesus and God the Father. And then he says, and all the brothers who are with me. There's this guy who does stuff in team. He doesn't go out alone. If you read, you know, there's Paul and Silas and Paul and Barnabas and there's Timothy. There was always people with him in what he did. There's accountability. I think that's a great model for us because even as we do our lives, you're not meant to be an island. You, somewhere along the way, you need encouragement. You need somebody to come in and build you up. Somewhere along the way, you need somebody to come into your life and to strengthen you and to speak into your life and go, man, just keep on going. We've got to have people around us. And then he says, he brings out what the audience is. He says, to the churches of Galatia. Now, that's context. And so just for today, th these five verses are just laying out context for the rest of the book. Of, uh, so we'll get more out of it in coming weeks. But it's, Paul is speaking to something to these Christians that, we, that they need to hear. So he's speaking into their context, but we need to hear it too because I think it speaks into our context. So he's speaking to the churches of Galatia. He has a map. Uh, why don't you put up the map there just so you can get an idea. Galatia is this area here. It's quite a big area. You can see the, the black lines here. That's Paul's first missionary journey. He would have established churches in Galatia in that first missionary journey. Um, it was something he did. Now, that's part of Turkey today. So you get an idea where we are on the map, right? Um, Joburg isn't there. <laughs> it's a, just around the corner, though. Um, when I went to America, like I, I said to... Because uh, it's so funny there. Uh, I said to some people that I was speaking to in a church, and I said, well, I'm from South Africa. You know where Egypt is? <laughs> We're nowhere near there. Uh, <laughs> but these are churches that were uh, in Asia Minor that now called Turkey. Paul had established in his first missionary journey. You know, he says it was a work of the Holy Spirit when the gospel was proclaimed. Um, but why has he written this? This is why we, we got to get down to it. Why does he write this letter? And it's because there's a crisis in the church. Uh, you know, this is a classic example of the apostle being concerned about the foundations of the church. So when he writes, he's addressing an area that needed to be addressed. There was a problem and he's going, we need to speak about this issue. It's a foundational problem. It's an important one. Because if we don't get the foundations right, if you're not getting foundations right, what are you going to build on that's going to last? It's going to endure. And sometimes as churches, we just need to do that. We need to go back and go, what are we building on? And so this is what Paul does here. And it seems that like there had been some very dynamic people who had brought in false teaching that enslaved the church, that enslaved people rather than freed people. This is the kind of thing that would go something like this. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And then you need to dot, 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 dress right, do this, do that. You know, sometimes we do that. As, you know, we, we, we have, okay, the gospel message, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Okay, 
and now you must, and we add a whole bunch of rules to it, right? You've all seen that before. This is the kind of stuff that he's dealing with. He's going, like, that's not the purity of the gospel. That's not what we're after here. And this is what he has to deal with. And so the gospel needs to be kept in its purity to know its power. You want to preach a powerful gospel, we need to preach a pure gospel. And I think that the purest gospel is the gospel in its simplest form, with nothing attached to it. So when we say believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, that's it. Are you hearing me? Because that's the glorious gospel. That's the, this is like, no, but surely I must do something. No, believe. That's all you must do. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You want freedom? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Trust him wholly. Trust him only. This means, you know, as we look at this, this is about us acknowledging that we're a sinner who has broken God's law. We acknowledge that we need forgiveness of sins and confessing our sin and turning from sin is what we need to do. But then we acknowledge that in Jesus, God's provision for our sin problem has been dealt with because in Christ, everything was taken on him at the cross. He died and he rose again so that your sins can be forgiven. Simply believe that. And so you acknowledge his blood that was shed for you. And you put all your confidence in his finished work. You know, friends, as we go through this book, I'm hoping that our perspective of the gospel is going to be challenged. Every one of us. That any ways that we might be believing another gospel and we could you know it's it's very subtle sometimes because it can look so good but God would correct us and we bring us back to what he says and maybe maybe we're we've been adding something to the gospel maybe we were like no 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 it's so easy because I'll tell you why it's so easy it's so easy for me because I'm a natural legalist like, put the rules in place. Don't, 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 don't. And Jesus is saying, done. And when you add anything to the gospel, you actually take away from it. So, here, a Scottish minister, P.T. Forsyth, said this he said the secret of the lord is with those who have been broken by his cross and healed by his spirit you cannot have real faith without the cross and you cannot cannot live the christian life without the spirit man i, I you're going to find this this is coming out so he appeals to these christians right at the beginning he appeals to them he sets the stage for the rest of the book as it uh, which has as its central theme, getting the gospel, getting it into our lives, getting it to affect our lives, to affect our passions, our mission, our relationships, our worship. Get the gospel. That's the key. And it's the key to grace and peace. Because it's from God. Grace, you know what the general definition of grace is, eh? God's unmerited favor undeserved it's God extending his hand to a drowning world not because he has to but because he wants to and as you take his hand you experience his saving grace and then you experience his peace and fruit it's an amazing reality it's like if you're a Christ follower today you did nothing to add to your salvation. Jesus did everything. You just needed to take his hand. And he would lift you out of that miry clay and put your feet upon a rock. Chuck Swindoll, he quotes one pastor, says, Love that goes upward is worship. 
Love that goes outward is affection. Love that stoops is grace. And he goes on to describe grace and he says this, to show grace is to extend favor or kindness to one who doesn't deserve it and never can. You can never deserve it. This is remarkable. It's like, man, if I get this, I'm going back to the very heart of the gospel where it's going, I am saved by grace. I've done nothing for that. God's done it all. I didn't deserve it. So we see this is from God. It's by God because God initiates this. He gave himself for our sins. He gave himself for our sins to rescue us. What a powerful statement. He gave himself. Hey, some of us, oh, well, I reckon probably most of us, look around you. It's like, would you do that for the guys next to you? Like, give your life for their wrongdoing. What Jesus did for us. It's remarkable. It really is remarkable. God's grace is practical. God's love is practical. It's about God giving us something that we did not deserve. This is going to come out again and again and again. And I want us, you see, when when we get this, this is going to impact our worship. Because you, you worship not from that place of, I'm going to sing a bunch of worship songs, and we're going to have an experience and we're going to walk away. But we come and we worship from the overflow of what's in our hearts. And sometimes, you know, I've had friends who just sing horribly. I mean, they just can't sing. Let, let's be frank. I, I've genuinely got some friends who just can't sing. But, man, because they understand God's grace to them, they sing like they can. Because it's just they can't help it. So this is a worship series. This should stir worship in us. Some of you guys, the men who go, uh, I don't like my voice being heard when I'm singing. I'll sing quietly. Uh, Man, God's going to change that. Because God wants you, he wants your heart, and he wants you worshiping him. Because that's the overflow. And you can't stop the overflow. You know what what I'm talking about. Because when you talk about soccer, you talk from the overflow. Now, this is a greater overflow that you're going to be singing out of when, because God has just so filling you that you're going to be speaking and singing and making music in your heart to the Lord. But it's for us. He stood in our place, taking the punishment for our sins. Just the Colossians 1.13, He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. That's what God has done. He's rescued us. He's brought us out. Maybe you don't even realize what all that's happened because you're still here in this body, in this world, in this place. Uh, But like the fullness of that, you've got to see with eyes of faith that God has actually done in your salvation. He rescued you and he transformed transferred you from the domain of darkness and he put you in the kingdom of the son he loves. Wow. Wow. He's describing victory in Christ for the believer through the blood and the cross. All that needs to be done has been done. All that can be done has been done. What do you have to give? Not an ounce. But come. Christ can set you free. I want you to believe this for others as well. Because I know that some of you, there's spouses, there's family members, there's children, there's others who who are not seeing this, but God can rescue them like he's rescued you. And all of this ultimately is for God. 
that last verse, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Apostle Paul is just getting going here and he's already in a worship service. Because he's going, like, I'm just look what God has done. Oh, to him be glory. I'm going to just go right there, right now, right at the beginning of everything I'm about to say. Man, this is about worship. God has done it in my life. He saved me. He loved me. He rescued me. He's redeemed me. I'm his. That's a work of his spirit in me. Man, all glory to God. And unless the gospel we believe results in the praise and the glory of God for his grace and his kindness to us, we haven't understood the gospel. Because you see, if you add anything to it, suddenly you get to get credit for some of it. And God's going, the credit's all mine. All mine. So, I'm looking forward to what God's going to be revealing to us in the days ahead. Might be a bit of a prick for us as we realize, wait, have I added something? Or have I tried to take away from something? The, the gospel. But when God gets us, he sets us, sets us free. You know, you'll come across verses like this. It's for freedom that he set you free. I've been crucified with Christ. It's not, not, no longer I that live, that Christ that lives in me. He's, he's, he's going to be going like this. This results in you being worshippers. Are you ready for a journey like this with me? Because I'm really excited to dig into Galatians together and to look at, be, like, let the gospel saturate us so that we learn to be effective worshippers, missionaries, like face life differently because we've got such an awareness of the fullness and the purity of the gospel that has come to us in Christ Jesus. See, the gospel, this is what I'm going to come back to. The gospel is good news. It's not that it can be. It is good news. Oh, Lord, do it in our heart. Let, let me pray for us as we look into the future and just go, Lord, do a work in us as we reflect on this. So thank you, Father, for each person here today. Thank you that we get to sit here and we get to open your word and you get to speak to us. And you use a, a man like the Apostle Paul, but this word that we are reading is still words that have been, it's come from the heart of God, breathed out by you. And they speak with your authority. And he's just a man, a mouthpiece, speaking with the authority that you have given to him. And I pray that, Lord, as we dig into this letter, that you would speak to us and let the truth that is here to resonate in our hearts and, dig and come and saturate our hearts and flow out from us, that those around us would be impacted by the difference you've made in our lives because of the grace and the peace that comes through that from you. We pray, do it, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So church, as you go, I mean, I just want to say, if there's anyone who doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, like, please speak to me. Uh, or others here who know the Lord want to help you cross the line of faith. But Maybe there's uh, just, this is something for you to take away and mull over for the weeks ahead. Just, oh Lord, let this, pray through this. L let your words saturate us in the days that lie ahead. Work for your glory, Lord. Amen.